I want to start off this morning by asking a few questions, questions that largely go unanswered in our lives, but nevertheless, we are very curious about them. For example, how come Superman can stop bullets with his chest, but he always ducked when somebody threw a gun at him? Or do one-legged ducks swim in a circle? If a jogger runs at the, I got an awe on that. If a jogger runs at the speed of sound, can he still hear his headphones? <laughs> if the police arrest a mime, do they need to tell him you have the right to remain silent? <laughs> what do sheep count when they can't sleep? Why do bars advertise live bands? Think about that one. How come there's only one Monopolies Commission? What's another word for thesaurus? Why do they sterilize the needle for lethal injection? Yeah. <laughs> Why do kamikaze pilots wear helmets? And this one's my favorite. If a man speaks and there's no woman to hear him, is he still wrong? <laughs> These, yes. <laughs> Spoken by a woman. Um, these are the many questions that we often find ourselves asking ourselves, and we don't get good answers for those questions, right? Do you ever sometimes feel like you really want to know some stuff, but you find that you're asking the wrong questions, or the questions that you ask don't really matter? That's where the disciples find themselves today. We have been working our way through a series entitled... Um, faith like a child, trying to diligently understand the call of Christ to become childlike in our faith. We started by looking at how God sees children, and we noted that children were so valuable and so important to Jesus that he stopped his travels to Jerusalem. He paused on his way to the cross so that infants could be placed in his arm and he blessed them. And then last week, we learned that in our faith, we are completely dependent upon the Lord for our salvation. We cannot, under our own steam, do anything to save ourselves from the coming destruction. We must be helpless as babes and rely upon the love, grace, and mercy of our Lord Jesus. So today we're going, to take, we're going to look more closely at becoming like a child and specifically how we can become childlike in our faith. So let's pray. O oh Lord, open up our hearts and our minds to your word this morning. Speak, O oh Lord, for we are listening. Amen. I've selected Matthew 18 verses 1 through 6 as our scripture reading for today. Please rise as we read scripture here. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child to them and placed the child among them. And he said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes such a child in my name <clears throat> welcomes me. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. You may be seated. Thank you. Well, as I said today, we're going to be looking at becoming childlike in our faith. And we, we will talk about what that really looks like in both Jesus' day and ours. I told you a moment ago that the disciples were asking the wrong question. So let's take a look at how the Gospel of Matthew is kind of put together and constructed. Matthew's Gospel is arranged in six blocks of teaching. And the teaching section that we're looking at today is in response to four questions that were put to Jesus. The first question is asked by the disciples together. Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? That's our question for this morning. The second question was asked by Peter, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother? The third question is asked by, to Jesus by the Pharisees, 
is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? And the fourth question was brought by a rich young man who said, what, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? So these are the questions that were posed and which Jesus responds. But as I said before, the first question by the disciples is the wrong question, revealing a wrong heart and wrong motives. At that time, it says, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? That seems like a good question, right? So Jesus takes this opportunity to instruct his disciples. He's not going to let this teachable moment go by. And so he calls a little child to him and he says, Truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like this little, like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, it is this verb change upon which this whole teaching relies. The Greek word here can mean a number of different things. It can mean change or turn or convert. Now, convert is way too full of meaning and, ha and has become a religious word dealing with our salvation. And that's not the right idea for this context. So what we're really talking about here is change or turn. It's literally like standing in the middle of the, of the road going one direction and turning around and going a different direction or the opposite direction. Unless you turn from your errant ways and become like this little child, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Notice that he said, you will not be greatest in the kingdom of heaven. He said, you won't even enter the kingdom of heaven, let alone be the greatest. They're asking the wrong question. And for those of you Greek grammarians out there, this is in the future tense, which indicates that the disciples had not yet made this turn or this change or this conversion, right? So let's talk about what Jesus really means. Jesus said, unless you turn, he was warning them that they were going in the completely wrong direction, asking the wrong questions, going away from the kingdom of God, toward, not towards it, going away from it. You know, in this life that we live, the question of, uh, of, of success and greatness is usually aimed, uh, is, has to do with what a man is aiming at or a person is aiming at. Is he or she aiming at the fulfillment of personal ambition, the acquisition of personal power, the enjoyment of personal prestige, the exaltation of the self? If you are, if that person is, they are aiming precisely in the opposite direction of the kingdom of God. To be citizens of the kingdom of heaven means a complete forgetting of the self, an obliteration of the self, a spending of the self which aims at service, not at power. The great Bible commentator William Barclay said, so long as a man considers his own self as the most important thing in the world, his back is turned to the kingdom. If he ever wants to reach the kingdom, he must turn around and face the opposite direction. So the instruction for these disciples is turn around change. Turn from, from being how you are right now and become like this little child. So, what aspect of childlikeness is Jesus referring to here? Children have a lot of really good traits that we could discuss here. Children are full of joy. They forgive quick. They're not ashamed in needing help. They genuinely want to please their parents. And they learn by imitation. Now, some of you know that I am a fan of football. And I particularly am especially fond of the Kansas City Chiefs. And I've been at Kansas City Chiefs long before they got Patrick Mahomes, and, and you know, they're doing actually well. I've, I've been a fan in the rough years. And I usually don't let people from church watch football with me. Because, well, let's just say I'm really passionate about the game. And sometimes I'm a little too passionate. But we're talking about learning by imitation here. So one day, when Joe was just a tiny little guy, 
we were watching football together. And completely unrelated to the play on the field that we were watching, and completely, it was actually a, a timeout, Joe does this. Oh, come on! <laughs> and he was too little to understand what was going on in the game. He didn't really know what was happening. But apparently he had seen me countless times yelling at the TV or the referee or whatever, and Joe was imitating me. It was kind of a real moment for me. Kids, they have a lot of different traits that we can emulate. But just so that the disciples would understand exactly what Jesus is telling them, he tells the disciples what trait he's talking about when it comes to being childlike in verse 4. Um, I threw up the ESV for you because the, um, the NIV in this case added like five words to tell you this, but um, it says, whoever humbles himself like a child is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is talking about humility. A conscious effort is required in humbling on oneself like a child. In one sense, the disciples had already humbled themselves as children when they believed in Jesus in the first place. This gave them access to the kingdom of heaven, but in another sense, they had abandoned that attitude as they became concerned about their status in the kingdom. They needed re to return to that former childlike faith. Likewise, they had exercised great power through simple faith in Jesus, but as time passed, they got away from depending upon him. They lost their power, and they needed to return to a dependent faith. Peter, for example, had this great confession of faith, but then very shortly afterwards, he regressed and failed to submit to Jesus. So, this involves a turning away from pride. The, the 12 disciples asked, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Now, the motive behind that question is self-promotion. The disciples wanted to be honored above each other. Pride was the un unintended, undetected cancer that, if left undealt with, would slowly spread and destroy them all. In his classic book, Mere Christianity, the great C.S. Lewis has a chapter called The Greatest Sin in the World. And with his characteristic insight and clarity, Lewis demonstrates that pride is the greatest sin. And he said this about pride. He said, a proud man is always looking down on things and down on people. And of course, if you're always looking down, you can't see something that is above you. And he writes this incredible chapter that defines the right kind of pride. I'm proud of my son. And the wrong kind of pride. I have to be the best. I have to be number one. And after discussing all of the subtle nuances of the ins and outs of our pride, Lewis ends this chapter by saying this. If you have read this and you are convinced that it does not apply to you, then it certainly does apply to you. Wow. That hits home. So if you've read the Gospels, you all know that this is not a one-off situation. The disciples seem to have a preoccupation with this idea of status and importance. Let me give you quick examples. In Mark chapter 9, verse 33, the disciples were walking to Capernaum, constantly arguing with each other on the way home. And when they arrived at the house in Capernaum, Jesus asked them a simple question. Hey, what were you arguing about on the road? Like he doesn't know, right? And their response is very telling. But they kept quiet. You know, they're like little kids who've been caught red-handed. Jesus' question embarrassed them into silence about their selfish attitudes. And then Luke chapter 9, verse 46, Jesus had just told the disciples about his fast approaching death. He clearly warns them, listen carefully to what I'm about to tell you. The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. Then Luke pitifully adds, and they did not understand what he meant. So Jesus had just bared his heart and his soul, yet in their ignorance they are again more interested in only themselves. They again turn their attention 
to which of them is the greatest. Jesus was taken up with the cross. They are taken up with themselves. Later in the upper room, also in Luke, this is the Last Supper. Once again, Jesus told his disciples of his impending death. And he gives them this simple visual picture of bread and wine. And after he explains this all to them and the meaning of this tremendous act of unselfishness and sacrifice, immediately they again begin to argue as to which of them is the greatest. Clearly, they're having some struggles with this. Now, I'm sure these are the disciples, right? I'm sure we can be fairly sure of the nature of their dispute. Was not Peter nominating John? as the greatest, and John bashfully thanks Peter and says, no, 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 not me, but Andrew. And then Andrew says, no, I nominate Philip, and then Philip suggests Matthew. That's what happened, right? Of course it didn't happen that way. Almost certainly they were nominating themselves. With Peter, he assumed there need be little dispute at all. It was, of course, him. This probably heated John a little bit. He was, after all, a son of thunder, right? He immediately accused Peter of being on an ego trip and then nominated himself to the disquiet of the rest of the disciples who were also eager to nominate themselves. Notice the response of Jesus to the question about the greatness is very the opposite of what we tend to think of regarding greatness. We tend to measure human greatness by a person's occupation or their position in society. A person's achievement or their wealth. Well, he's a lawyer. My son's a doctor. You know? When Jesus talks about greatness, his insights and values are the opposite of the world. He holds up a child as the example. The message? The one who is the greatest is the one least concerned about being great. The one with the least amount of power and influence. Only a small, small thing, a little humble child, free from guile, free from pride, full of faith, full of wonder, full of a desire to please, full of humility. Just a little thing. Let me ask you a question. Raise your hand if you are a parent. Okay, good. Have you ever stepped on a Lego in the dark? Have you ever wondered how something so small can prov that provides so much enjoyment can cause so much pain? You're in luck, because I'm going to explain the science behind this pain. There are basically four reasons that are wrapped up in this. First of all, you hear people talking about stepping on a Lego way more than you hear people talking about stepping on, say, a Hot Wheels or a My Little Pony or Barbie shoes, right? And that's because, number one, there is an incredible amount of Legos out there. According to the Lego Corporation, there are enough Legos in the world for, for every person on this planet to have 83 bricks. Just let that sink in for a minute. Also, even though Pinterest suggests that there are people who play with Legos on the table, almost always they're played with on the floor. So that's where they end up. And secondly, when we step on these little torture devices with the sole of our foot, our foot has a huge bundle of nerves in them, making it very sensitive. And we need these nerves because they help us balance, right? Thirdly, Legos have sharp corners and little knobs that helps to aggravate all of those little nerves on the bottom of your foot. And finally, Legos have no give in them at all. They are really well made. While many toys have give and they break at some point, Legos don't. Those in the know tell us that a Lego has been subjected to 4,240 newtons of force before it deforms. And that a single brick can support 953 pounds of force before it compresses. That means when you step on a Lego, 
instead of giving away and absorbing some of that force, it transforms all of that force back up into that beautiful foot full of nerve endings. No wonder you say ouch and other creative things when you step on a Lego in the dark. And if you step on a Lego, you want to hope and pray that you're stepping on carpet. Because if you're on tile or a wood floor, all of that, trans there's no give at all. There's no absorption at all. It's, it's terrible. I read a really cool article about this sort of, um, that's at least fitting this week. Uh, Drew Dyke, who is an editor of Christianity Today, wrote that he recently heard his five-year-old son preaching to his three-year-old sister. And when he finished his gospel presentation, he said this. He said, when Jesus comes back from the dead, he can do anything. He could even walk on Legos. And that's better than walking on water. To the disciples, it seemed like a very small thing to be discussing who would be the greatest in the kingdom of God. But those discussions, that preoccupation with status and power was causing a lot of pain, like stepping on a Lego. But Jesus holds up as our example a different small thing, a little child, and he says, be like this. Be humble instead of proud. Be teachable. Be unconcerned with your status. Be a servant to all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Be changed. Turn from your selfish ways and be like little children. And then he says this as a big warning, so take heed. If anyone causes one of these little ones those who believe in me, to stumble. It would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Wow. So in case you were wondering who it was that Jesus was teaching, it's definitely the disciples because he called them to be sent out to teach the people. And now he is warning them, if you don't teach them right, millstone around the neck. To be childlike in our faith, we must put aside selfish ambition. The kingdom of heaven, it's not about that. We must not seek to be great, to lift ourselves up. We must turn from those desires and go towards the kingdom of God. We must, like little children, be unconcerned about such things. A child already knows who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. It's Jesus. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this word and for this message. Help us to become like little children, Lord. Help us not be concerned about self-aggrandizement, status, prestige, being the best. But instead, Lord, help us to be imitators of you. Simple, humble, and childlike in our faith. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.